I finally read the Ubik by the PKD. I don't know if it quite matches the level of frenzy that people have in terms of their enthusiasm for it. Oopsies. But it is right here. It's very good. It is very, very good. I don't think I like it quite as much as I liked Man in the High Castle. Philip K. Dick, I have heard described as elevated pulp. And I never really connected with that description just because I haven't really read that much of him. But Man in the High Castle is not elevated pulp. This is elevated pulp. This is like an action movie. So if you like Blade Runner and Total Recall, uh, probably this is up your alley. It was certainly up mine. And I know that Philip K. Dick wrote a screenplay for Ubik and it's never been turned into a movie. I'm sure there's some kind of Wikipedia article that's 5,000 pages long about the, the uh, unmade Ubik movie. It reminded me of a book called The Futurological Congress by Stanislav Lem. It shares a couple of similarities with that book. One of them being the, um, the, the ramp up period is pretty tough. There is a lot of terminology thrown at you and a lot of it is neologisms, words that you really have to work to wrap your head around and the full meaning of them is not revealed until deeper into the narrative. And it's pretty dense and um, that can be prohibitive to a lot of readers, especially science fiction readers who haven't dedicated their life to reading science fiction books. But once you kind of get your head wrapped around the broad outlines of the plot, it does become a page turner. I would say the first third to a half was the first time in a long time that I have been really excited to pick a book back up. I've read very few science fiction books, even the science fiction books that I really love, that were true page turners. Psychics are real and you can hire out this private company to have psychics help you in your life or professionally conduct espionage for you, monitor your friends and enemies. And there's another firm that you can hire that are counter psychics called inertials who work against them to protect people from psychic influence and observation. And the inertials get called up to this big job and things go horribly awry. And it devolves into this psychological spoon bending, mind bending, Philip K. Dickian journey. I can't say too much more about that without spoiling it, and I can't really talk about the themes without spoiling the ending, which I thought was a little bit of a letdown, I have to say. I do go into full detail on this on my Patreon. I just started it. It's five bucks. It gets you access to individual reviews for every single book that I read in advance of these summary videos. I have a 25 minute long review on Ubik. The nutshell is, I thought it was really good. I gave it an eight out of 10. I don't know, people talk about it like it's the Bible. People talk about it like it's the most mind blowing science fiction book ever written. Uh, the most meaningful science fiction book ever written. You will walk out a changed person. I walked out an unchanged person. This might have to do with the fact that Philip K. Dick's literary maneuvers have become so shorthand and they've become so known. I think it does subtract a little bit of the wow factor from Dick because in the back of your head, having heard as much about Dick as you have, it is kind of difficult to be truly shocked by these uh, kind of onion layers of psychology and onion layers of what is real and what is not real as maybe, I kicked you again, as maybe uh, if you hadn't if, if you were reading this in the period and you weren't as familiar with his legacy. But still definitely recommended. Is it one of my favorites ever? No, but it's very, very, very good. Next is a book called The Goat Without Horns by Thomas Burnett Swan, which is a fantasy book and the second swan that I have read and reviewed, the other one being Will of the Wisp. He is an obscure writer. He um, was an American writer who was also a poet and he, wrote a series of novels set in this continuum where creatures of myth and legend are real, but they are retreating from the encroachment of industrialization and modernity into remote strongholds where they can, they can continue to live. And this is one of the first books in that series. This is also one of the worst books that I have ever read, and yet I love it. It is truly awful uh, in all of its big picture details, but some of the 
the fine lines are uh, great. To jump to the end, I gave this a perfect 5 out of 10. And this is a game that I like to play, a game that I, was taught to me by a friend. Name something that is a perfect 5 out of 10. It can't be good enough to be a 6, can't be bad enough to be a 4, and it's really tough. And there are two kinds of perfect 5s in my experience. There's the true 5, which is just neutral all the way through, and then there's what I call the quantum 5, which is peaks and valleys, high highs and low lows that equal out to a 5. This is the most extreme quantum five I think I've ever come across. The lows are like Mariana Trench abyss level lows and the highs are great. He was capable of producing beautiful writing and there are some relationship details in here and some love scenes that are, um, I think some of the, the, the prettiest that I have read. And then there is this element of grotesquerie and farce and stupidity that suffuses the entire book that is kind of unique to it. The story is told from the point of view of a dolphin. We're already off with a bang. Dolphins are sentient, dolphins have language, and they also have an oral history that includes the history of the human species. They remember through their oral traditions their time as land-dwelling mammals before they evolved into an aquatic species. They travel around in big pods and they tell each other these epic Homeric tales about uh, the history of the land dwellers and of the dolphins. That part is actually pretty cool. That's just the first part. And then one of the dolphins named Gloomer, who is depressed, breaks away from the pod and goes to live in the lagoon on this tropical island that is also uh, inhabited by a beautiful English aristocratic woman with enormous breasts and her 15-year-old daughter. And I include the detail that just made you perk up in your seat because that really is the focal point or points, I guess, of most of the book, as it kind of was with Will o' the Wisp. So this woman who lives on the Caribbean island puts out an ad in the paper in England for a tutor for her daughter. And it's answered by a college student who's 20 years old and named Charlie Sorley. And Charles Sorley was a real world figure. He was a poet who died in the First World War. And I'm sure he would have been thrilled to wind up being portrayed in this book as the pseudo-erotic companion of a talking dolphin. Charlie comes to the island, makes friend with Gloomer the dolphin. They go traipsing around on uh, adventures through um, dangerous, dangerous narrative terrain that actually I probably won't even discuss on YouTube. It gets so hairy and weird. The way I will describe it is like watching Thomas Burnett Swan walking through a yard, just stepping on rakehead after rakehead after rakehead. It's a weird mixture of complete unawareness and incompetence on the level of plot construction and thematics, and notable competence when it comes to the actual writing of the prose. Thankfully, it is kind of a so bad it's good and what the hell is he doing spectacle kind of badness. Otherwise, I don't think I would reserve any praise for it at all because it's just simply so weird. It's like a, an X-rated version of some Disney TV movie daytime thing about a talking dolphin and his friend. There's also a 20 plus minute review on the Patreon of this if you actually want the full details. And then we wrap up with The Midwitch Cuckoos by John Wyndham. One of the original cozy catastrophe novels takes place in a country village in England called Midwitch where some mysterious happening renders everybody in the village unconscious for a period of a couple days. Everybody wakes up, everything seems to be fine, and then things are not fine. This book is a little bit exasperating to talk about in this format because so much of the meaning of it and so much of the character work and the things that are good about it are wrapped up in spoilers. It's the second Wyndham book that I've read after Kraken and Wakes, and it shares some similarity with Kraken and Wakes, especially a fairly cynical, despairing view of the media. Journalists are portrayed as, as predators and are this secondary threat lingering in the background always. It deals with heavy themes. There's some sophisticated 
philosophy at the core of it, especially at the end of it. And it has an interesting gender dynamic um, that I can't, again, say too much about without spoiling the at least the first big reveal. But it has a lot to say, seemingly, about the relations between men and women. And the book is portrayed sometimes as being sexist, and in some elements I think that it probably is. In others, I think it was uh, remarkably contemporary in certain subtle dynamics and power relationships between the men in the book and the women in the book, I thought were notably progressive, maybe, although it is enigmatic, it's hard to tell. And the final concluding philosophical quandary is deeply interesting, and I really like the way that it is handled and the way that it remains mostly unanswered, and it poses a very tough question. It's considered a horror. I didn't find it scary, but I did find it creepy. My only real criticism is that the middle chunk gets really slow and bogged down in character development and details of life in the village, and it takes a long time for the plot to kick back in, and then the ending is great. I like the book a lot. It made me appreciate Wyndham and understand a little bit more why he has the staying power that he does, because he's often held forth as one of the literary greats in science fiction. He writes great, lucid, competent prose that is satirical, is mildly funny in parts, and can be very evocative, can also be quite, like I said, dry and slow. Reminds me of Arthur C. Clarke, but I think he was a better writer than Clarke, and I think his perspective was more interesting, and he chewed on grisselier philosophical problems than Clarke did. The next three book video should be coming relatively soon because I'm reading a ton, uh, so I will see you there or on the next video. Appreciate it.